Hey everybody, we're going to do some time series regressions in Stata, uh, specifically the finite distributed lag model. We'll see how to use the results of that model to generate a long run propensity, a cumulative effect of an X variable on Y over multiple time periods. Um, we'll also look at uh, how to optimize the lag length of that model using the information criterion. Okay, so let's start off by getting some data. So we'll go to the, the tried and true Fred Hughes Federal Reserve Economic Database uh, as our, our source. And again, we're just picking an example here. So let's imagine we're just going to look at two variables, um, say the federal funds rate and the three month US T bill rate. So we'll go uh, Fred Hughes Fed funds. So Fed fund, that's, that's something different. Fed funds and the three month T bill rate is the TB3MS. And those are both in monthly frequency. So we've got our data. Let's generate a time trend. So gen T equal to underscore little n. Let's tell Stata that that is our time series operator. So TS set T. Uh, and then we'll kind of restrict our sample because this goes way back decades and decades. Um, Again, this is just for the purposes of getting some data for our example here. Uh, let's say keep if t greater than, let's say, uh, 750. All right, so we browse our data. So that'll take us all the way back to 1996. Uh, so again, we're just thinking about all the, the structural breaks that have happened in between, but we're, we're not trying to necessarily uh, get the perfect model here. So it goes all the way up through uh, August uh, 2020. So there is our data. So now what we're thinking about doing, again, generating, estimating a finite distributed lag model uh, and the notation, right? We would estimate an FDL model of order Q, where Q represents the number of lags of our explanatory variable that we're using to explain the current value of our dependent variable. So for our example, we might be looking at uh, in differences, how does the how do past values of the federal funds rate influence current values of the three month T-bill rate? Is there a uh, causal effect over time there? So the notation here in the, in the slide, the YT variable would be our three month T-bill. The ZT variable would be our, uh, our federal funds rate. So what we see there is an FDL2. So could not be easier. We don't have to do anything fancy. We can just run this with an OLS regression. So we would go regress uh, and we are going to do this in differences. So we would go D dot TB three MS. So that's the first difference from one period to the next uh, as our dependent variable. And then we're going to apply the lag operator to our exogenous variable. Uh, and so we wanted to do this, say, as an FDL two, we could go L and then in parentheses zero slash two dot D dot then the name of the variable. So we're going to take the zero lag, the current value, first lag and the second lag, all of the differenced version of our Z variable that fed funds rate. So that would be the, the resulting regression there. And what we're looking at in terms of those coefficients, right? those are the lag specific marginal effects. So for example, what does this number mean here? The second lag. So if the change in the federal funds rate two months ago was one unit, the resulting impact on today's three month T-bill rate would be a decrease of 0.03 units. And here it would be in uh, percentage points, right? Lag by lag by lag. Okay. So that's as that's all you got to worry about in terms of uh, the estimation. Just use OLS, specify the lags. If you're using differences, specify with that difference operator within the regression command, uh, and then we end uh, we end up generating those again lag specific, period specific marginal effects, the so-called impact multipliers. Okay. Another nice thing that we can do here is generate 
the sum of those coefficients, the so-called long-run propensity, which rather than isolating the impact of one lag effect, it's going to be the cumulative effect over multiple periods. So if the federal funds rate went up by one unit, 100 basis points, for three periods in a row, what would be the cumulative impact on today's three-month T-bill rate, for example? Okay. So we could just you know, take those numbers. So in our case, the 0.84 minus 0.05 minus 0.037, add those up, and that would be this LRP, that summation there. Uh, we also, want, of course, want to know if that sum of the coefficients is statistically significant. Right? So we could do that here using the test command, where we would go test, and then the name of the coefficient, and it gets a little bit dicey here, right? So we'd go test d dot fed funds plus l dot d dot fed funds plus l2 dot d dot the second lag of the difference of fed funds and notice that we're not just listing them out like we do with a standard joint significance test uh, here we're testing whether or not the sum and then we got to specify the full uh, null hypothesis equal to zero and we hit enter and we get a very strong rejection of that null in this case, so an F statistic of 208, well beyond the 1% critical value. So we have found a significant long-run propensity. The only downside is that this, using the test command, doesn't give us a number, right? Because you always want to be able to present, well, what is the long-run propensity? What is the cumulative impact? So again, we could just plug those numbers into a calculator, put them into Excel. Uh, but there's an alternative command that will give us the same result, a significance test, in, that includes the value of the, the sum of the coefficients. So the command here is lincom, L-I-N-C-O-M, that is going to give us everything that we need. A uh, hypothesis test regarding the sum of the coefficients, the linear combination of those coefficients, and the actual value of that summation, that long-run propensity, again, that so-called cumulative effect. So our process here, uh, pretty much exactly what we did in the test command, so I can actually just copy that line, but I don't need the equal to zero, that is implied as the default in the lincom command, but you do need to sum them up because, again, a linear combination can be uh, just about anything. And we know that we do get a t statistic as our test statistic here. Uh, the result, however, is qualitatively the same. So we have a, a test statistic that's significant well beyond the 1% level. So we, again, find a statistically significant long-run propensity, and we get a number here that we can now report, right? So across three successive periods, three successive months in this case, the cumulative effect of a one-unit increase in our Z variable, the difference in Fed funds, is a 0.75 unit increase in our Y variable, in this case, the difference in the three-month T-bill rate. Okay, pretty good, right? So now, one other thing that we need to address, uh, that we really should have addressed already, is that when I estimated this model up here, this FDL2, well, I had to come up with that 2 somewhere, right? How many lags should be included in the model? And that, of course, is a specification question. So we could use, right, we could run multiple models and compare adjusted R squared, compare significance levels, uh, etc. But the default in time series regressions to optimize the specification when the question is how many lags of each variable should be included is to use one of a handful of information criteria. So let me give, give this a shot here. The Akaike information criteria, the AIC, uh, is a, a common choice, right? There's also the, the Schwartz or the Bayesian information criteria, as we'll see, also uh, generated by Stata. Um, but these are all more or less alternatives to the adjusted R squared, right? The ingredients essentially are exactly the same with just a 
different weight put on the two sides of the, the balancing act, right? Remember the adjusted R squared rewards you for bringing down the sum of squared residuals as you add a new variable, in this case, adding a new lag, but penalizes you for having to estimate a new coefficient for reducing the degrees of freedom, increasing K, right? So those ingredients are, are right here in front of us uh, in the information criterion. So two times K, that is the, the weight placed on the, the penalty for increasing the lag length. Uh, and then here we have this term in the sample size times the natural log of the sum of squared residuals per observation divided by N. So every time we add a new lag, K goes up, RSS comes down, we want to only proceed if the net effect is a reduction in this balance, right? So we want to see a lower RSS relative to those degrees of freedom. So we want to choose the lag length that minimizes the AIC. Okay, so what we would do, we would go back and call out the information criterion from our first regression. So in this case, the the FDL2. So we know, right, looking at our Stata output, that there is no information criterion automatically generated. There's a couple ways to do this. The estatic command uh, is going to be uh, a good choice. And that's going to bring up from the most recent regression the information criteria. And we, hear, we see it's a negative number. So that comes from taking the natural log of a small value less than one because our values are in difference interest rates. So the numbers there are going to be pretty small. But the idea is the same. We want to choose the lag length that gives us the smallest possible value here. Right? So as you can probably imagine, this might set forth a little bit of a tedious process for us. Right? So we could call back up our regression. And instead of, I guess we should start from the beginning, right? So instead of a 0, 2, we could put in a 0, 1 estimate that, call up the information criterion, so e stat i c, and we get a value here of negative 373.74. Say, okay, so that was where we started. We, when we added the second lag, we get a value of negative 369.96. So actually the second lag is less negative than the first lag. Say, so, wow, okay, that's interesting. Let's try it again with three lags and see if that improves things from the first two options. Now it's negative 367. Okay, so so far the model with one lag, the current and the first lag, seems to be the best. But we don't know if it's going to get better at lag 4, 5, 10, or whatever. But that essentially is the process. Okay, now the last thing is to get away from the monotony of having to do that regression by regression, line by line, copying and pasting the AIC into a little table, looking for the lag length that gives you the minimum value. This seems to be the perfect opportunity since we are replicating the same commands over and over again with just one little tweak, adding one to the lag length. Uh, this is a perfect opportunity to use uh, a little program, a little for each loop within Stata. So I will put this uh, little sequence of commands in the uh, in the description of the video. Always a good idea to put it in a do file. Uh, but just looking at the uh, combination of commands here, we're going to use the put Excel command. So this is going to generate an Excel file with the results specified. And the results are specified within a for each loop. Uh, so I'll link to the uh, kind of the video that walks through in more detail uh, what uh, all the ingredients are for a, uh, a loop, but all we're doing is putting the regression that we're running here with an unspecified value, i, for the last lag. And then we're looping different values for that lag length. So here I'm letting i go from 1 to 20, and then every time I run a regression, I generate the ic, so I use the e stat ic, and then I put that result into a, an Excel file called results that's going to show up in your working directory. For, so for me, that's going to be my desktop. So I can 
go ahead and execute these commands. So we'll use the, oh, 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 I already did that. So let's call it results one. Let's make up a new file name. That'll show up in the same place. And do, 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 do. And then I can just copy that entire sequence, drop it into the command line, execute it, and there's 20 regressions scrolling by. And now we have uh, file results one, XLSX, has been created. So now we just got to go find that in your working directory. Again, for me, that's just going to be my desktop it should be right there. There we have it. So these are the degrees of freedom. So this is lag length one through 20. The degrees of freedom account for the intercept and the contemporaneous value as well. So you could do something like this, right? We could take these values and within Excel, you could do this in Google Sheets as well. Just generate a little plot and somewhat surprisingly it looks like every time we add a lag length the AIC increases so somewhat surprisingly it never got better than it was here at lag length one that is surprising but that's what it tells us right normally we would expect this to be maybe a u-shaped function with an optimal value at somewhere in the middle, some lag length. Uh, but here it says, you know, adding all those extra lags didn't actually help. Who knew? But now we do, right? So obviously your results will vary depending on the uh, data that you use. And we have a very underspecified model here um, that should be including additional variables. But there you go. Um, so the finite distributed lag model, the long run propensity uh, with a couple different ways of generating it the information criterion, and then to top it all off, uh, a little bit of a loop to try to optimize your model. Okay, so if you have any questions, put them in the comments and hope this was helpful. Thanks.